I was first introduced to Dr. Phelps in mid-1940. I had been born in Washington, D.C. in January 39. I went abroad. My father was a diplomat in Berlin, Germany. And when the European War began, my mother and my sister and brother and I came back to the United States. And we were staying with friends in Boston temporarily when I began to, to show signs of weakness on my right side. And a doctor in Boston that my mother visited suggested that I come and see Winthrop Phelps in Baltimore. He didn't know what was wrong with me. He said it was something more than just a weak ankle. And he, he said that Winthrop Phelps was working on something and that perhaps he could diagnose me properly. Um, my mother brought me to Winthrop Phelps. He examined me, and I think he examined me well because he said, I have cerebral palsy. I'm not sure they even used that word in those days. It may have been called spastic paralysis. But I was his patient then for 21 years, and he took good care of me. He, his um, clinic was at 3038 St. Paul Street, a row house in downtown Baltimore. And I remember visiting him several times a year. I was in Europe a lot of that time and would come back specifically to, to be treated by Winthrop Phelps and where he would examine me and adjust my braces and things like that. His clinic was simply a row house, as I said, and we would arrive and on the first floor was the waiting room. On the second floor was his office. And I remember seeing the other children there, uh, some more severe than I, and they had to climb up these stairs. We all had to climb up these narrow stairs to go to his office. And that's where he would measure my leg. He would, I remember he would tap my knee to see the, the nervous reaction in the leg. He would measure for my braces uh, on my right side. I wore a brace on my right leg and my right arm. Um, in contrast to today, it was quite heavy. It, it was a leather shoe, it was an iron bar that came up the side, both on my leg and my right arm. And he would adjust this every three months or so as I was growing older. Often these tools uh, were not replaced, this equipment was not replaced, he simply adjusted it. And I remember, perhaps it was because of the shortages at the end of World War II, when my foot got too big for the shoe, he would simply cut off the toe and my feet would grow out. And I remember once somebody saying, what do you do if it's cold? And he said, just put a sock over your shoe. So that's the way I went, got through the seasons, perhaps. But there was nothing else. So there was not a question of was he doing the right thing or the wrong thing or the useful thing, that's what existed. And there was no second guessing, there was no complex about it, nobody ever told me at all that perhaps I looked funny because I wore these braces. I was fortunate enough to go to regular schools, I guess you could call it, and once in a while I was badgered, I was bullied a little bit, uh, and I had to fend for myself. But it never occurred to me to do anything else. Um, in, and in those days, there were no therapists or counselors to advise you on how to deal with what would now be called stressful circumstances, situations. One faced these things and one coped. My parents, looking back, were extraordinarily helpful to me. They gave me tough love. At, a, at the earliest age, they said to me, that I would have to learn how to get things done because the chances are, and God willing, I would outlive them. And they, they wanted to make sure that I had the confidence and the, the best wherewithal to do the best I could. Um, and that continued on. I think it was a combination of my parents, my older brother and sister, and Winthrop Phelps. It never occurred to me that I was suffering it never occurred to me that I needed society to take care of me, although I benefited certainly from the medical attention I was getting, which was probably pretty good for that time. Um, and I realize in hindsight that a lot has improved since then. I have seen the facilities here at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and am 
quite impressed with all the different specialized treatments and therapies and counseling that's given. I think it's terrific. Um, and, I, uh, and I do it the best I can now as an adult to help that move along, to, to, to contribute something that I can. But in my time, there wasn't much second guessing or I would call it the, 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 the emotional complexes that might go along with a handicap of this kind today. And I understand very well that I'm a, only a hemiplegic. I have a, a moderate case of cerebral palsy on my right side. And although I had very difficulty speaking when I was young, I stammered terribly. So when I was five years old, Winthrop Phelps suggested that I take speech lessons. It wasn't even called therapy in those days. And I did go to a speech therapist in Washington. And I remember the first year, I simply was told, don't speak, just stop speaking. Uh, and I would have to write out everything I needed. Now I cheated all the time, but the idea was to get me breathing properly again. Get me, get the rhythm of, of my diaphragm and my tongue and my voice in sync somehow. Um, it was not easy for me, um, but I, I had no choice. Um, and I was tongue-tied, and what they did was cut the membrane under my tongue. And I remember that was very painful, although I got ice cream for it. And in those days, ice cream was still a little bit special. So that's the way I was treated and dealt with when I had these special, um, the special attention given to me. I had a terrible time speaking for about two more years, and then suddenly it got better. And I remember my parents saying later on, laughing and saying, well, you talk so much now, maybe we made a mistake in, in helping you learn how to speak properly. But that was all with great love and affection. I stopped seeing Winthrop Phelps just before I went to university. Uh, I was 18 or 19 years old. And that was the last time I saw him. Um, uh, and then I went through university. Uh, I, I stopped wearing my braces. Um, I, by then I began to think about helping other people who had worse disabilities than I. And I remember I went to the University of Nebraska and I earned a little money by, by tutoring football players, which got me a good seat at the, base, at, at the football game. Um, I tutored blind students um, and that gave me great pleasure, great, great satisfaction. Um, I realized going, looking back, there was an amusing side to this. Um, the football players who knew I was handicapped were very protective of me. And once in a while they would come to me and say, is anybody giving you a bad time? If they do, I can punch this guy out. And I said, no, everything's gonna be fine, don't worry. But there's something also a little reassuring about that too. I, was, uh, I had good friends who, who I would ask them now what they thought of me in those days. Anyway, I left that world. I went to university, I graduated. Uh, then I got employment in Washington, D.C. Um, I worked in Congress. I then worked um, briefly as a journalist, and then I worked for 27 years at the World Bank, and I really didn't think much about the world of cerebral palsy. I had, was, I had lost touch. I knew about the Kennedy Krieger Institute being started, but I had never been up here. Towards the end of my career at the World Bank, uh, um, I was sent to Russia. I had never been to Russia, and I, I, I was taken there by some friends and diplomats. When they saw that I was crippled on my right side, they asked me about myself, and they asked me to go with them to see a clinic in Russia, outside of Moscow. And I saw a clinic for crippled children in, in Russia for the first time and that fascinated me and I said to myself that's the world I'd like to get into and soon after I retired from the World Bank I joined a group of people who were helping a doctor in St. Petersburg Russia who treats kids with cerebral palsy and I've been going there for now 13 14 years very rewarding for me so I and that's when I first went there I came up here to Candy Creek because I was I didn't know I was trying to get my bearings, and I, and I met with um, uh, Gary Goldstein and Chick Silberstein, 
uh, and I told them who I was. They, had, they kind of checked the, the books to see that I had been associated with Winthrop Phelps. And I asked them, I told them I was going to Russia and could they advise me on some things I might learn, uh, um, journals, medical journals I might read to, to bring myself up to, up to date on the field of cerebral palsy. Well, one thing led to another and I kept my contacts here too. Um, a little later on, I was asked by Alec Hoon, who now heads the Cerebral Palsy Clinic, if I would join a group of parents here as an advocate, part of their advocacy work. And I've been doing that for several years too. Very rewarding for me. I've learned so much because I was out of touch and I've learned more about myself too, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. The parents I've met here are quite remarkable. Now, of course, that's by definition. They wouldn't be doing this if they weren't remarkable. But I find it uh, how they find the time and the energy and to allocate their, their day with other children, with, with, with a child who, who has special needs, as they call it now. Um, I can see that these women, and often father, mothers and fathers, have dedicated their time to make sure that their child does as well as he can under the circumstances. And that means that they have a recognition, which I've always felt going back years, before I knew people who, in, who had to face this with their children, that you have to strive for the next level, whatever that is, up that ladder. When I was young, the word cripple was perfectly common. It didn't bother me. It wasn't, wasn't an issue for me. If the other person who was calling me a cripple, if that was a problem for him, that's his problem, not mine. I didn't have any problem with those words because there were no other words to use, um, or retarded even. Um, and I realize today that has changed, and I think it's changed for the better. Um, although sometimes I have to remind myself I don't want to offend anybody. And there was one meeting with a group of parents where I was sitting at the table, and I'm not even sure they knew I, I had cerebral palsy. And I used the word, well, when I was a cripple kid, and one mother got upset. and She said, you mustn't use that word. And I stood up a little bit deliberately to show her. And I said, look, please excuse me. And I don't at all want to offend you, but when I was a child, this was the common word, and I can tell you, it didn't offend me, because we had no, no choice. Um, and I always felt if the person who was a bully to me, who, who was aggravating to me, it's their problem, not mine. And my parents remind me of that too. Anybody that gives you a bad time or insults you, or is a bully to you, because you have cerebral palsy, that's his problem, that's their problem, not yours. And I think that's an attitude one should, has to grow up with. Um, and I still feel that applies today, whatever words you use. But I have learned to, to appreciate the, the new descriptions. And I, 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 I understand the parents, some of them feel very strongly about it, and I will accommodate their wishes as best I can. If I slip once in a while, I have to ask for, for forgiveness. Oh, I've learned so much here. I was so out of touch for decades that to come back to the world and see what's being done now, both in terms of the institutional attention that patients get, but also the technology. And I'm pretty much of a Luddite. I can barely send an email on a computer. But to see the equipment they have here, which, which can show inside the brain and the pressure points uh, that they now recognize as those parts of the brain would send signals or where signals are interrupted. It's amazing. And what strikes, and I, when I first sat and saw some of this stuff here at Kennedy Krieger, I would say, how extraordinary. And the doctors would say, it is extraordinary, but we're just touching the surface of knowing what the brain really is. We're just, it'll take another 30 years to, to really know more. And that's exciting to me too. Um, there's something else here in the, new, in the new building downtown which I found fascinating and that was the big swimming pool on the top floor. When I was a kid, I loved to swim. I was thrown in the water when I was probably three years old. I could take my braces off. Ah, it was so relaxing. My parents would simply throw me in either Lake Geneva or in a swimming pool and I had to learn how to swim and I would just be buoyant. It was so wonderful. Ah, 
But that was new a little bit. Not everybody did that. A lot of other parents who had who had children who had cerebral palsy were rather shy about that. They weren't sure that was the. They were afraid their children would drown. Anyway, of course, now that's become part of, of regular therapy, and for good reason. For me, just getting those heavy braces off and being buoyant in water. <laughs> Was that a wonderful moment? So I, in many ways, I tell people now, it's a little bit uh, uh, simplistic, but in many ways I swam better than I walked for many years because I, I had to learn. Uh, and I've seen that here. I've seen the new equipment. It's extraordinary. <laughs>